All right, you're live. Hey, everybody. Kevin Gain here with uh, Team Losi Racing. Uh, we're here again for episode six of uh, In Touch with TLR. Uh, last week, it was a little rough. You know, I, I'm trying to do these every single week. Um, we were at the Silver State. It was really loud. I know a couple people said that it was really hard to hear. So I wanted to give a short recap real quick of what we talked about last week, which was uh, working on some diffs. We're building some diffs. Um, I have this diff here that's already completely built. Um, it's got grease. Like I said last week, make sure you grease in these out drives before you put them in. Uh, same on this side. Make sure you grease those out drives. Make sure you wipe off some of the grease on the center diff uh, so you don't get any grease on your brakes, which is what we're going to talk about here in a little while. Um, so I just want to talk first about the biggest part was uh, just filling the diffs because I think it's one of the things that uh, is comes up a lot. We have a lot of questions on filling the diffs up and how much oil and how little oil you should put in and kind of you know how to do it. So we have a really easy, um, specific way we do it with the race team, um, and it, it's really simple. You really can't do it wrong. I wish I would have brought a rag in here, though, um, which I don't have. So I will, uh, whoop, <laughs> got a rag. Thank you, Rich. Um, so I'll show you here. Basically, fill up the diff. Um, I like to fill the four corners up with oil, just like this. Um, in between these little holes here, I like to put a little bit of oil just so the oil will run down into those holes. Um, you really can't go wrong. There's going to be air in there regardless because if it was completely full with zero air, you're going to get hydrolocking and things just aren't going to work. So um, don't worry about it. Uh, you do want to spin it around a little bit, get some of the big, big air bubbles out. Um, you can use, like I said last week, you can use one of those uh, pumps, the Tamiya pumps that you can put the diff in. and. Pump it up if you like, if that's the way you like to do it. There's nothing wrong with it. Continue to keep doing it. Um, but I don't really find it necessary. Like I said, you, you're going to have air in there regardless. Um, so you want to just get all the big, big, big major bubbles out by spinning it around. And then what I do, what we do with the team, we uh, a lot of people will, uh, will put this gear here on, the, uh, on like this and put it on. And that's where you get in trouble because you can't really control how much oil is coming out of the diff when you put it together. The next thing you know, this gets saturated with diff oil and then it, it starts leaking. So this is how we do it. You take the gear, you stick it right inside of there. You see all the oil that flows out, take your hand, wipe that oil off, make sure it's wiped off real nice and clean. Then you wanna spin the diff just a little bit. You'll have a little bit of oil that'll come out of those four corners. Wipe that off there again. And that's exactly how much. So now if you look and see, when you spin it real lightly, you should see a hole where there's no oil. That means you have the correct amount of oil in there. Uh, simple as that, guys. That's exactly how we uh, how we fill the diffs uh, with Team Losi Racing. Put the gasket on here. Then you will put this on. I don't have all the right tools here to complete this perfectly, but we'll do our best. So we have... Uh, couple screws. I'll just throw two screws in this because really what I want to talk about this week is the uh, eight scale brakes. You don't want to tighten these down really, really tight the first time. Uh, you want to do these in a cross pattern when you tighten these down. Just like that. I'll throw two screws in for this one. You want to tighten these down in a cross pattern uh, and then get after those screws. Uh, you know, it's really hard to strip those out. Don't get after them necessarily with your drill because you will strip it out. But I see a lot of people that just tighten those down and then stop. I mean, get after it. You need this. You need to crush that uh, gasket a little bit because that's how basically how a gasket works. So don't go, don't go light on those screws. Make sure you get them nice and tight, um, and you'll be good to go. You'll have a lot less diffs leaking because of that. And uh, that's how we do this. Uh, so now let's get into what we came here to talk about. Uh, this week we came to talk about eight scale brakes. Um, let me clean up here a little bit. Uh, the eight scale brakes, you know, there's a couple of methods um, that people do. I think one is really important to me. Um, the first is, let me get set up here, guys. So number one, you want to make sure that you're using our new diff, or our, sorry, our new brakes. Uh, it's a metal disc with a uh, fabric or a, a pad material, like a real brake pad. Um, these uh, have been tremendous in brake performance and brake fade. Um, our old brakes that come with the kit, um, 
They work, they work really, really well. We just had a problem with them fading after uh, 30 minutes of running, basically. Um, so we developed these, which have a lot less or no brake fade, really. Um, you do want to make sure you clean these before you put them in. You can find the part number to this in the description up above. I put the part numbers for the new brake system in there. Um, you also want to make sure you're using the springs that come in the kit uh, when you put the shoes on. Um, another thing when you put the shoes on, you'll notice that these shoes are slotted on one side and a perfect hole on the other side. And what that is, is you need to make sure that the slotted hole is going on the side with the tank, so the left side of the car, if you're looking from the back. Um, that, that slotted groove basically, uh, when you have the rotating disc and you apply brake pressure, it releases the brake pad from the, from the uh, disc when you let off the brakes and it allows non-sticking, basically is what it does. Uh, so that's that. Uh, make sure you're using the new brakes. It's a, it's a big, big uh, advantage um, with braking power, longevity. Um, but let's talk about setting up your brakes here. Ryan Dunford was nice enough to loan me his car today. Uh, he's going to JBRL this weekend, so it looks uh, like it's still dirty. He needs to work on it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so brakes are, are one of the most critical things in aid scale. Um, you have so much power with your brakes. You have so much control over your brakes. Uh, in the 10 scale world, you really have not nearly as much control. You basically have your speed control settings. You can add more brake, less brake, frequency, stuff like that. But in the 8 scale world, it's really neat. You have so much power. You have so much adjustability in your brakes, which makes it really, really nice. Um, and there are some some tricks and stuff to setting the brakes up, some stuff that I've learned along the way with the 10 years that I've been doing this with the team. Um, for one, everybody you know sets dead band with their throttle. Well, a lot of people don't, or nobody really talks about setting their dead band for their brakes. Well, I set dead band for the brakes. I set dead band for Dakota's brakes and our, our, a lot of our other key uh, team drivers that, that I work with closely. Um, there's a difference and it, and it allows you to have an adjustment. It allows you to easily go back and know where your brake settings are at by having and thinking of a uh, dead band when you're setting your brakes. So I'll show you how we do that. Uh, but first I want to talk brake bias um, because brake bias depends on your dead band and how you set that dead band. Um, Dakota and some of the top level drivers, they like a 40-60 brakes brake power. 40% um, in the front, 60% rear. Uh, a lot of people find it a little hard to drive with a brake bias like that, being more rear power than the front. Um, but it gives the car a lot more steering um, because your front tires are not braking while your rear tires are actually slowing you down. You have a little bit more, uh, if you can handle it, you have a little bit more control uh, and you have more steering with that. Um, then where you find a lot of people because they can't drive with a 60-40, they go right to a 60-40 opposite. So 60% rear and 40%, uh, I'm sorry, 60% front and a 40% rear. Um, that is good. Um, I don't really prefer it myself, um, but there are a lot of people that do. I would suggest if you, if you are using that to try and get yourself more to a 50-50 brake bias. I find what happens uh, when you have too much braking power when you come into a corner, the front end's just gonna to wanna to dive down to the ground. The rear end's gonna get really loose because it's up in the air um, because you have so much front braking power. Um, but if that's the way you like it, go for it. There's nothing wrong, there's no right, there's no wrong really with any setup. It's what works best for you. Uh, but I will say that if, if, you, if, if, it, if you do your brakes that way just because it's the easiest for you to drive or just you don't really have an idea of your brake bias, Try to move yourself more to a 50-50. I think the majority of people, 50-50 um, is the most ideal. You're gonna get on the brakes, the car's gonna have more of an even braking field. You're not gonna get so out of control. You're gonna have even grip. Um, now the next biggest mistake that I see um, a lot of people make, which it honestly, it hurts your longevity of your of your servo, your throttle servo, is having too much brake brakes in your, in your throw of your throttle. Uh, in your throttle brake servo. Uh, what I mean by that is when you're on the track and if your tires are locking up well before you're all the way into the brake throw, you're wasting brake power and you're wasting and damaging your servo at the same time. 
Um, once your tires lock up on the track, that's it. You're not getting any more brakes. It doesn't matter how much more you push on the, you press on the brake, the brakes, you're not going to get any more. Um, so ideally you want to get your brakes to right when you get to full throw, your brakes start to lock up a little bit or lock up and that's it. That's, that's where you want your brakes really to be. And you need to really fine tune that once you hit the track and that, that might change from track to track a little bit. You may, that's why you see a lot of the top drivers messing with their radios and stuff. They're messing with their, their brakes and they're making sure that their brakes are right. Um, and that's, that's that. I mean, that's really the, the gist of it. Um, not having too much brake power. You just want your brakes to slightly come to a, a, a locking point at full brake throw um, and go from there. 50-50 is where I kind of recommend everybody starting. Um, if you can get yourself to a little bit more in the rear, a slightly more in the rear, you might like it. Um, if not, I think 50-50 is the optimum braking, braking power. Um, so yeah, let's get into how we set this now. So I do brake bot, I do brake uh, dead band, and this is basically how I, I, I set that up and I check that. Um, and whenever Dakota has a problem with his brakes, um, we, I always go back and I check to see where his dead band is at on his car with any given race that we're at. Um, Dakota likes a, well, first of all, I missed this. We got to go back here and talk about this. Uh, Rich, if you can zoom in here, um, zoom in here. The, this is really, really important. Um, these screws right here that, that screw on and tighten down your, and set your brake pad adjustment on your rotor. That distance needs to be, I like to leave about a gap like this. If you can see that gap there, it's probably two header cards. I know we put out something there a little while ago about using a single header card. I found that to be a little too thin. Um, if this gap, if this gap here is too big, the cam will over rotate and get stuck on the pad. And when that happens, that's when you're out on the track and you hit the brakes and your car sticks. The brakes stick on when you release the brakes. It's because either that cam that floats in there and rotates, which is applies the brake pressure, either is worn out and it's allowing it to over over rotate and get stuck, or you have the plates too loose. And when you turn, you get to a certain point, obviously, where the cam gets stuck on the brake pad. Um, if that happens, you need to check if your brakes are getting stuck on the track. You need to check this gap here. Like I said. Um, you want a decent gap, but you don't want too much. Uh, if you if you have the gap too tight, um, you won't be able to get your brake uh, you won't be able to get the brake dead band set right. You'll have a really 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 tight dead band, and you're going to have instant brakes, and you're going to have brakes that could drag, uh, which you don't want. We don't really use drag brake in eight scale, so pay attention to that. I like to use about two header cards. I would say it's about a millimeter millimeter and a half. Um, uh, of gap um, and make sure you're using the little springs that were in here it's very important it keeps the the it helps bring the pads back and it gets it away from the uh, the rotor itself and allows to not have any drag brake so here's how I set the uh, dead band um, if you are using a front bias more front bias than rear bias you need to start with the front if you're using a 60 40 or you, you are using more brake bias in the front, you need to do this from the front tires by checking what I'm going to do. Um, I, myself, I use a little bit more rear brake. Um, Dakota and a lot of our factory drivers, they like a little bit more rear brake. So I'm going to show you the, the example of how we do it using the rear tires. If you have more front bias, you need to do the exact same thing that I'm doing using the front tires. So all you do is you want to make sure your radio is on, everything's functioning. Make sure it's up on a car stand. Um, I hold the radio on the left tire and I just spin this tire. I don't have my finger on the throttle or brake right now at all. I just spin this tire and then I slowly, very, very slowly start applying throttle, or I'm sorry, applying brake. And I watch the throttle or the, the throttle's brake horn here and I kind of gauge the distance that I'm moving it. And as I'm doing this, I'll slowly start applying some, uh, some brake to the, to the radio. And right there is where I first see the brake pads touching the rear rotor. So now I can just barely feel a little bit of pressure on the rear, rear tire here, which means I'm just touching the brakes. That basically right there is my brake dead band. That's my adjustment right now. 
Um, this to me is probably a little looser, right, right there. It just touches, it just touches the brakes. So that's my dead band. It's no different than setting your throttle dead band. It's the exact same thing. And obviously you want whatever bias is first that's going to contact first, whichever one you have the most uh, percentage to is going to be your first brakes, brake pads to touch. Um, so like I said, that's the dead band and that's exactly how I check it. So then what you do is once you have the dead band set the way that you want it, um, this, this right here you can see was probably uh, almost a quarter of an inch. Um, that's probably a little bit more than I like to run. Um, that is a, dr a driver preference. Um, you don't want to get too, too big of a gap because then what happens is you start applying brake and then you have a lot of brake really late in the throw, which is what you don't want and which is what Dakota hates. Um, so the, the, more, the sooner you can get it without having your brake stick, which I like to go around about an eighth of an inch to maybe three eighths of an inch um, of, of gap of dead band in the brakes, you get more of a braking feel because you get a linear brake all the way through. Um, that's the benefit of doing it that way. Um, so then, now what we want to do, once you find your dead band and you have it all set up, now you're going to set your brake bias. So now you have your brakes here that are functioning here in the rear. Oops. So you do this, basically, set your brake bias. So Dunford here has probably a little bit more than 40, 60 brake bias. Um, maybe, maybe it's pretty close. It's probably pretty close to about a 60, 40. So Dunford likes more rear brake than front. Uh, like we do um, what you do now is you set your bias and then your brake overall braking power that you have is done on the track and that's done in the radio with the travel you just basically turn the travel down or up for the overall braking power that you want that is not done through setting these 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 settings here these settings are only to set your your brake bias and your dead band and your brakes the rest of it is all done in your radio on the travel. Um, so if you're like out there on the track and you're like, hey, I need more brakes, you don't come in and have somebody adjust your, your, your settings here on your linkage. Now if you're saying, hey, I need less front brake while you're out on the track, they can come in and do a, a quick change on the fly of doing your front brakes and, and taking a little bit or a little adding a little bit of brake power front to rear while you're on the track. Um, so that's really what I what we do as a team. Um, like I said earlier, brakes are extremely extremely important. Um, if you if you can if your car is perfectly under control on the throttle and going around the track, but you have no control of your car under braking power, it's you know it's the same thing. So you need to have control of your car. Um, one of the biggest things is overpowering your brakes. Um, I see that time and time again. If you have too much power, like I said earlier. When you hit bumps, the car starts bouncing around. It won't absorb the bumps. Uh, you'll have no steering because when the front tires are locked up, they can't steer. They just slide like a plow. Um, so, yeah, that's it. I hope everybody has some questions for me. I got um, one. I actually have one for you. Yeah. What settings do you put the radio at when you're setting the endpoints or that type of stuff? Like, do you start at zero, 150, yeah, you know? So you to adjust wanna, that pressure. Yeah, so when you set up your car originally, everything's, you know, right at 100 and 100. I like to take mine halfway down on my brake side and halfway down on my throttle side. Um, it's You can hurt your carburetor and you can hurt your servo by having them at 100 and 100 and yanking full throttle while you're setting up all your, all your car. If it's a new car or you're just binding the radio and getting everything set up, um, you'll, you will literally pull this and yank the throttle barrel. You'll, you'll damage the inside of the throttle barrel of the carburetor by overextending it. Um, so I instantly, whenever setting up a new car, I take everything from, from 100 all the way halfway down, and then you bring everything back up to the setting so you don't over or damage anything in the process. Um, that's definitely something I always do. Um, same thing with, uh, you know, it's just like when you do your slipper on your diff, you know, when you put a new diff in your two-wheel drive, you loosen your slipper up so you don't bark your diff while you're breaking your diff in, tighten your slipper back down once your diff is set. Um, that's something that I've always done. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions uh, specific on the, the, what we talked about today with the brake bias and the, and the brake settings and the dead band, throw them at me. 
Um, if you have any other questions on just anything else, um, throw them at us. Be more than happy to answer them for you. Um, sorry about last week, guys. It was super noisy. I hope most everybody was able to uh, to get what I was talking about with the diffs, um, the diff bias, and and so forth. Um, one quick thing, you know, all these videos are uploaded to the YouTube, um, whether it's either the day of or the day after um, I shoot these videos. Um, so you can find all the stuff that we've talked about in the past on the uh, Team Losey Racing YouTube. Um, I also throw up about uh, on our Instagram with the videos that we're doing. Um, so be sure to check them out and have your friends check them out. I hope these are helping. I've gotten tons and tons of great feedback from everybody so far with these videos. Um, if you have any videos moving, anything that you guys want to hear moving forward that you guys want to talk about, throw them in the comments below. I'll, I'll more than happy to shoot the video and talk about it. Um, that's really what this is about. That's what In Touch with TLR is all about. Um, so yeah, any questions, Rich? Not that I see. I mean, I don't know if you're supposed to refresh it or scroll it up. I, I yeah, you got to roll it up a little bit. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't see anything here. All right. Sorry, guys. First time Facebooker live video cameraman here. <laughs> and Rich helped me because this video uh, required a little bit closer detail with the brake stuff. So I wasn't, I didn't feel like we would really get a good, you guys would get a good feeling of it by it being up on the, the uh, tripod and uh, kind of far away. So um, Corey Blue has a question. What is the difference in braking feel and power between the heavy duty brakes and the regular brakes that come with the kit? There is a... There's a small difference initially when you hit the track. Um, the new the new pads, the new brakes with the the metal rotor and the the, the real style braking pad uh, material is a little bit smoother and it has a little bit more braking grip. Um, I find it easier to set up. If you ever noticed when you when you hold the hold the brake on and you kind of set your brakes, it, it kind of goes clunk clunk clunk. You know, there's kind of different. You know, there's there's high spots in it. Well, that's what these really fix all, all as well. There's, I mean, you can see these are just very smooth, um, very very smooth. But the biggest, the the main reason we developed these 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 brake pads was we were in Italy at the World Championships, and it was mediocre. It was pretty warm out. Um, the track was extremely fast. It was a European style track, mm -hmm. and. There was tons of grip. You had asphalt, concrete, you know, diff different different track conditions, and our brakes were fading. Um, so we we came back after that race and we sat down, and it, it took us a while, a long while, to develop this product. Um, it, it it was mainly not necessarily the the rotor itself, but the ma different materials that you can use and get for these brake pads themselves. Um, took a lot of time and a lot of different pad materials to get what we wanted correct. Um, so the best benefit is really comes down to the heat, uh, brake fade. So if you're running a 30 minute main uh, or a one hour main, what we do at the Worlds, um, you, we, would, we would see brake fade after a certain point of period of time on the track. Um, and that's really where it came from. And that's the biggest, biggest benefit to these brake pads. So. I'll answer the next one. Larry Tom, what's the crawler in the background? That's ECX Barrage with a with a <laughs> Proline body on it. Brian Nunez did that one. <laughs> yep. Um, All kinds of cool stuff in here. RC Rob Whiteman. LLRC video question mark. LLRC. Oh, oh, he wants to see a low roll center video. Oh, gotcha. Um yeah. I'm novice, sorry. So I, I could shoot a video that, about that, but I'll talk about it here for a few minutes while we're here. Um so this this pivot you can see this car has an LLRC on the rear of it. Um we developed that pivot um working with Dakota and honestly we were working with uh, Gil Osteen Jr. at the time. Um this was probably last year, uh the beginning of the year. Uh, we were out working at uh, dialed in RC Raceway, and we started we started messing with stuff, trying to trying to make things better like we always do. Uh, we started changing the roll center in the front, uh, started changing some different things, and we came up with an idea like, hey, how can we lower the rear pivot? So we took an HRC pivot and we turned it upside down, we grinded it, made it fit, and Dakota went out there and he ran it, and it was instantly better. Um, he was a lot faster. The car had so much more traction, so much more rear grip. Um, 
that we decided that Dunford decided and we've come out with the product and uh, it, it's a there's a mixed majority of people uh, I think right now it's probably 50 50 split a lot of people like it and a lot of people don't um, the guys I think that are liking it or from what I've been hearing that like the LLRC are guys that like a lot of throttle they really like to get in the gas they like to get on the throttle early um, they like to drive it like an 8 scale the guys that are liking the standard LRC pivot in the rear, uh, they like to drive the car, I think, more like a 10 scale. Um, they, like to, they like to get the car around the corner. They're not so throttle happy, and they like to go, get going in a straight line. And uh, I think it's ideal for us to have both of these pivots because we're, we're working, we're allowing it to work and are getting our car to work better with two different driving styles. Um, so yeah, that, that's really where it came about, and that's the benefits of it. You know, I think it's it's purely grip at the moment. Um, bump handling, I would say, is about the same, but it's just just traction. It just gives the car more rear traction. Okay. Vinny Lafada, will this work on 3.0? What are you referencing? I don't know what he's referencing as far as uh, the the brake setup stuff and the the rear pivot will work on a 3.0, no problem at all. Um, all the brake stuff is all the same. Um, all the adjustments and adjustability, everything that I talked about is the exact same, um, and it will work on a 3.0. Corey Blue. Uh, you might need to change. We run the we run the front spindles in the up position when we run the LLRC. Um, you might have to get the 4.0 caster block and spindle if you want to run that option as well. Should an LLRC be used with a Truggy? We have tried it with Truggy. We have mixed feelings on it at the moment. Um, we've been we've been doing a lot of testing with our Truggy lately, uh, mainly at the track, yeah, at the races that we show up to. We've 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 come up with two different things. Um, the L, the HRC on the Truggy really helps the Truggy turn um, from the front of the car, and it gives it a lot of support. Dakota has been running the LLRC on the rear of the Druggy, and he likes it because he likes how he can drive the truck really, really hard. Um, I don't believe that the LLRC and the HRC is is as big of a deal as it is on the buggy. Um, it's a lot. It, it's basically a lot smaller percentage of traction and stuff like that that you gain out of it. So it's worth a try, but if you don't have one, you don't necessarily have to. Give it a try. Holy Peter, you see price, but price for what? Need to be specific, sorry. If he's talking about price for the brake stuff, the part numbers are all in the description for both mm -hmm. the springs that you need for the brakes and the new brake system. So uh, you can go to the website and you can definitely check out the pricing on there. So, that it? That's it. All right, guys, I'm going to give you one more minute. If you have another, any other questions to throw at me right now, throw them at me. Um, I hope the brake setting stuff was really helpful. I hope you'll take it to heart and give it a try because brakes mean so much when it comes to racing. Um, like I said, I'll give you a real quick recap. 50-50 um, brake bias, I think, is where, where I think everybody should start. If you are using more of a front brake, I'd like to know why. Um, and I'd like for you to give it a 50-50 chance and, and try the 50-50, oh, even over the rear, rear bias. 50-50 um, braking power is gonna give you a much more consistency around the track, a much more consistent brake feel. Um, so if you are running more front, give, give the 50-50 a try. Let me know how it goes for you in the comments. Um, I think you'll be more happy with it. Um, but yeah, brake dead band, super important. It's very important. You can always go back at any given time. You can check your brakes because you'll know how you want your brake dead band to be. Um, so, yeah. We got any more questions, Rich? Any news on the gas truck? Joe Laws. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Joe. <laughs> I got my best man, Frank, on that. <laughs> that it? That's it. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I really appreciate everything. I'll see you all next week. Throw in the comments below. If you have anything, check out all the uh, YouTube videos uh, over at YouTube. And uh, see you next week. Appreciate it, guys.